to the afternoon session after an enjoyable lunch and uh, actually it was hard to come back to this building uh, after this beautiful uh, weather outside. Uh, so, but yeah, we have exciting talks and uh, the first talk is by UNZ and he will talk about over parameterized network, neural networks and other cool stuff. Okay, thank you for the introduction and thanks for coming. So today I'm going to talk about learning and generalization in over parameterized neural networks uh, that is beyond kernels. So as usual, uh, this talk will be extremely simple and I hope everyone can understand and enjoy the topic. So it will be extremely simple. Uh, so let's start. Uh, as usual, we also start with a bit history of machine learning. And so let's start with the history of the practical side of machine learning. What happened uh, for the practical side of machine learning, I'm going to draw a graph uh, that is labeled by time and the power of the model. So uh, on the ancient time, which is about uh, uh, 20 years ago, so people usually use single layer learning models for practical machine learning. So what are these single layer learning models? They are single layer perceptions like linear regression, kernel method, or linear regression or feature mappings. And you can see the power is slightly uh, is, is growing, but it's saturated at some point. And then there is a phase two of practical machine learning uh, that boost the graph a little bit higher. And what I call it the convex regularization phase in the practical machine learning. And what are these algorithms? They are essentially feature mappings with convex regularizations. For example, you add L1 regularization for lasso or you add nuclear norm regularization for the quadratic feature mapping, or you add PIC regularization for the powerful architecture like sum of squares. They are all convex with regularizations, and they are pretty powerful. And then we enter the phase three of practical machine learning. And what happened in this is we really jump into the multi-layer learning model uh, uh, like a couple of years ago. And these are, what are these models? These are like multi-layer perceptions. And usually people call it deep learning. And also there are other non-convex algorithms that belong to this framework, for example, base net or graphical models. And so, so let's, let's then start with the theoretical side of machine learning. What was the history of the theoretical side of machine learning? So we can see like phase one, so we basically have the theory that can catch up with the practice. So we understand most of the fundamental question in this, math, in this single layer learning model. So we understand sample complexity and computation complexity. And then we enter phase two, we even have a tighter connection between theory and practice. Actually, many of the algorithms are actually inspired by theoretical work, their origin nation is theory instead of practice, but they, are, they, are, they run very well in practice. So we also have this graph. Now, what happened to phase three? Interestingly, we are going back in time. So we suddenly go from here to all the way down here. And what happened in theory, so what is this A point? Uh, in the park learning setting, A is actually like linear networks, neural networks with one neurons, or a neural network over one dimension inputs. So they are extremely weak models, and people, uh, in order to study like multi-layer learning model, people are forced to now go back to his go back to time and then study like, for example, linear network that can only learn linear functions. So here I'm only saying the power of the model is very weak. I'm not saying anything about the depth of the theory. Actually, there are a lot of very fundamental theory in the like, linear network. For example, what Tong Yu did or what Professor Madre did. So they are quite, quite deep. But I'm, what I'm saying is just the power. And then what about B side? This is like uh, training last layer of the neural net, which is still convex and actually reduced to the conjugate kernel, so it's still below the line of kernel method. <coughs> and so what about C? So for C, it's a little bit more interesting, and people start to like learn, for example, multi-layer neural net with kernel method, like uh, the beautiful work by Jason. So uh, 
learn the multi-layer neural network using kernels, but still they are using kernels, so it's still below the line of kernels. And then most recently, there is an approach called neural tangent kernel. That is, neural net can essentially learn, uh, essentially learn everything that are learnable by polynomial kernels. So we're getting closer to the threshold of the kernel method. But still, we are not going above that. So still, our theory is below the edge of the convex regularization. And what I should say, there is a phase three prime in the theoretical machine learning, which is here, in another dimension of this uh, graph. What are these phase three prime? These are like learning neural net or other models with very strong distributional assumption of the inputs, and usually just a spherical Gaussian. And why it's in the, a different dimension is because it's usually unrealistic in practice. Actually, the machine learning community interested in real world application always find this setting very questionable. And according to Ron O'Donnell, they will punch you in your nose if you try to tell them that your, your algorithm only works in this framework. So clearly, I don't want to get punched. So today, I'm going to focus on distribution-free pack, pack learning instead of the distributional assumption learning. And in this talk, we will cover the the D phase, the neural tangent kernel, and we also cover the E phase, that is beyond kernel analysis for neural networks. That really jump above the line of the kernel method. Yes? So on, for part A, you had learning one ReLU, but I don't, how do you learn one ReLU using kernel methods? Uh, it's like uh, you learn up to epsilon accuracy <laughs> with like exponential in one or epsilon many samples and running time. Right, but I assume that the kernel methods line means polynomial efficiency. Uh, no, no, it's like, uh, yeah, it's polynomial, but if you want, if you think of epsilon as a constant, like you learn just a ReLU up to constant accuracy, then you can do that. Right, but I'm saying the kernel method line, you're allowing those methods to run exponential in the accuracy parameter? Uh, yeah, I'm cheating a little bit, so it's usually polynomial, but just for ReLU, it's, uh, it's exponential. Right. Yeah, for sigmoid, it's, uh, it's, it's also, yeah, it's polynomial, yeah, yeah. yeah. So also it's in distribution-free pack learning. And so let's start with the neural tangent kernel. What is tangent kernel and neural tangent kernel? To so recall, uh, like a Mercer kernel is just a function over a pair of input, and which is an inner product between two feature mapping that can have arbitrary dimension, even infinite dimension. So this is just a. This is Mercer kernel, but usually when we talk about kernel method, we, we basically mean this kernel. So now given a smooth function that has a parameter w and an input x, so we can expand this function at parameter w0, which is super simple. So just write the Taylor expansion. So f of wx is equal to the base point plus the gradient times linear plus some second order term because the function is smooth. And now here is a tangent kernel, which is super simple, given by the feature mapping of this function, which is just the gradient part of this. So you can see this is a feature mapping because it's only a function of x. Yes. So it's not a function of w because you put w0 inside. So it's a, it's a multi-dimension function. It's a feature mapping. And this is called the tangent kernel of this function. What is neural tangent kernel is very simple. It's just a tangent kernel, so where f is just a neural network, and w0 is by default a random initialization. That's what we call the neural tangent kernel. So here is the theorem about neural tangent kernel. Uh, so it's very, again, very simple. So given convolution or fully connected or even extendable to with batch normalization, L layer uh, ReLU neural network, uh, F of uh, W, where W is the total parameter and X, with M neurons per layer. So given if the network is trained on N distinct example, if the following OPS condition are satisfied, what is this OPS condition? So you have over parameterization, which is m is bigger than polynomial in the number of neural and uh, the number of layer. 
So there is an O in the overparameterization and O in the polynomial. And the P, which is proper initialization. And typically, it's just a Gaussian with the inverse uh, of the number of neurons per layer. This is what people use in practice. And then there is the small learning rate, which is the learning rate is smaller than some one over square root as the number of neurons. And if this OPS condition are uh, satisfied, then the following condition is true. So SGD just find a W star efficiently with small training loss, where the objective function can be cross entropy L2 or any convex objective a loss function. So such that the network is just equal to its starting point plus the gradient. So the first order expansion plus a little of one term. Okay, so this is a very simple theorem. It just, uh, what it says is just that uh, if the OPS condition is true, the SGD just learns efficiently the neural tangent kernel solution. Instead of learning a full neural net, it just learns a neural tangent kernel solution. And so this uh, gradient of whatever is the feature mapping and W star minus W zero is a linear regression. So gradient, so SGD training, uh, so if the OPS condition is true, then training neural network is just approximately equal to the linear regression over feature mappings given by the gradient of the random initialization of the neural net. Okay, so that's a theorem. And so it's extremely simple. And also, if that's true, then the problem is convex and everything is extremely easy. And you can see these are like rather reasonable assumption, like over parameterization, proper initialization, and small learning rate. There are no, no crazy assumptions, and there's no distributional assumption on the training examples. So the theorem is uh, super simple, but there are kind of two difficulties in the proof. First of all, it's ReLU activation. And remember, the key intuition is like we can do a Taylor expansion of the function. So there is like this term which is uh, only true for smooth function, but for ReLU function, which is not smooth, you don't really get this term. So you don't have the second order term for, for like uh, a ReLU function. And so this makes it a little bit more tricky. And also the m bigger than polynomial in L. So even consider smooth activation function, this uh, order of something is usually the smoothest times the distance. But uh, the L layer network is typically two to the L smooth because you have L layer and each layer is kind of like a norm two because you have ReLU that kills like a half of the neuron. So it's typically like two to the L smooth instead of poly L smooth. So in order to prove such a theorem, you need some non-worst case bounds. So these are like two difficulties, but still the theorem is super simple. <coughs> and what is the intuition of the proof? Again, it's super simple, so you just have a two-layer ReLU network like this, summation of AI ReLU of WI times X, M neurons. And what is proper initialization? The proper initialization is AI is just a Gaussian, standard Gaussian, and WI zero uh, per neuron is like a, a Gaussian with two to the M. So the output at initialization is order of one due to cancelization because each ReLU, the size is one over root M. And then there are m of them, but the AIs are random, so it cancels. So the output at initialization is order one. And then the neural tangent kernel defined by the initialization is nothing but the, in sorry, I forgot the AI, but uh, there should be some AI in front of that. The neural tangent kernel is like an AI times this guy. So there is a simple observation, which is there exists a, a weight W star that is very close to initialization, so W star has small training loss. Why this is true? Because when you learn the network, you are not going to learn something that cancels with AI. You learn something that aligns with AI, so you don't get cancellation. So each neural only needs to contribute one or M, and AI is an order of one, so the total contribution is order of one, which can override this output. So you, there exists a W star that is very close to initialization, so it has small training loss. And 
again, this is super simple and super intuitive. Um, like, uh, and this means that W star minus W zero times X is in the order of our M, but W zero times X is in the order of our root M. So the sign pattern doesn't really change uh, for each training example. And that means the neural network stay close with NGK. And you can see that as M gets larger and larger, it's getting closer and closer to the NGK solution where the sign pattern is just initialization. So this is the intuition, but it's basically the proof. And so the explicit two-layer proof is in this paper, like learning over parameterized neural network via stochastic gradient design structured data in the, like a, a year ago. So this gives the first explicit proof of this, but it's super simple. So what's the takeaway message? The takeaway message is just if the OPS condition hold, like OPS condition is over parameterization, proper initialization, small learning rate. If this condition hold, then the training neural network is super simple. Like a uh, training neural network uh, by SGD is equivalent to learning via its neural tangent kernel, which is a convex optimization problem. And you can derive all the bounds you need as long as you have the OPS condition. So at this point, everyone is happy giving the smiling face, uh, maybe except, uh, for example, him. So, yeah, when I was visiting MIT, John asked me this question. If the neural network is really a neural tangent kernel, then why do we use neural network instead of kernel method? Uh, at that time, I mean, I wasn't able to answer the question, so the visit went uh, not very well, but... <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so I was only be able to say something very weak, like uh, uh, the neural network do better in practice. Uh, for example, like in uh, CIFAR, the best neural net achieved 99% accuracy. This is the state of the art. You can search it on the night. It's a very crazy network, but still 99% of accuracy. But kernel method can only achieve 85 using random trigonal features, or 77 using infinite with NTK, which is a neural tangent kernel when the width of the M goes to infinity or uh, only 65 if the NTK is not that large, like 180. This is uh, actually pretty big, and it takes like a day to train it, but still it's very, very bad. But this is like practice. Can we prove that neural network actually do better than NTK in theory? And here, I'm going to show a result in this setting. So what you prove something like the anti oaths condition, which is uh, you still keep the proper initialization in the oaths, and either you change the over parameterization to something like semi over parameterization, or you change the small learning rate uh, to large learning rate with noise. Then a three layer ResNet can distributionally freely pack learn a concept class that is more efficient than any kernel method. By any, I really mean that we prove both upper and lower bound. So we prove an upper bound for, for, the, for, the, for the generalization error of the rest net, and we also prove a lower bound for the generalization of any kernel method. So it's any kernel method, just uh, either NTK or any crazy thing you can come up with as long as it's kernel. So the efficiency is like a sample complexity, running time or memory. Okay, so this is uh, what we are going to show. And what is a learning network is just a three layer net, rest net with ReLU activation, which is very simple. You have uh, inputs and then a linear and then a ReLU and then identity mapping that only jumps one nonlinear layer. So you jump, the identity mapping jumps through one ReLU like this, and then you do the, go to the output layer. So it's very simple, it's a single steep rest net. or if you want to write it in mathematical formula, it just looks like this. And what is a concept class? The concept class is just a three-layer rest net with infinite order smooth activation. By concept class, I mean like the target function you want to learn. Uh, something like this, like hx is equal to some fx plus alpha times g of fx. 
where alpha is something small. I don't really mean little of one, but some small constant. So what does it mean? It just means that you have a base signal that is very simple and it's large. And then you have a composite signal that is small, but it's hard because it's composition. And you can visualize it like this formula, like f is this simple formula. And there is actually an arrow in the formula. Can you spot it? Yeah, 16 divided by 4 is equal to 3. That's wrong. And, <laughs> and because the learner used that formula, the calculation of g is actually also wrong. Yeah, but uh, so you, you can see that the base formulas are very simple, and but they form a large population. And then you can use this base formula to get the, the composite formula that only has one of them. But it's, uh, it's difficult. So it's some, some learning task like this. But it's a little bit different because now the two functions add together. So it's kind of like you blur these two things into one function. And what is f? f is a k output, k dimension output function that is equal to f given by f1 up to fk. And each of fj is just a, a, some, some neural network with smooth activation. And the freedom weights are order one, uh, are unit. And the G is also the same. It's just a neural net. And what is the complexity measure of this function? So for any of these activation function where the input is norm one and the weight is also norm one, and phi like infinite order smooth, you can do the Taylor expansion. And then you can define the complexity of an activation function which is very simple, just the summation of the absolute value of the coefficient times is uh, it's basically just the, 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 the Lipschitzness of this thing, or you know, it's, uh, whatever. So CF is just equal to the summation of the activations, and CG is equal to the summation of the activations for G. So it's a very simple measure. It's, it's super simple. OK. so. Uh, why do we have this measure? Because first of all, if the activation function is crazy, like it jumps, shoo, 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 of course you cannot learn it. And also this is the sample complexity or time complexity to learn by using kernel method. It's, it's actually using polynomial kernels. Okay, so these are the sample complexity. So basically what you keep in mind, these are the complexity to learn the function using kernels, to learn either f or g given the training example like x or x prime. OK, so now we have the, so, so, so sorry? So what is the, what is the consequence here? Really? Uh, it's just uh, all the things that can be written in H whose uh, complexity of f and g are bounded by the following measure. So the both c of f and c of g are bounded by some constant, some value c. And that C is the complexity of your concept class. And where, what, and those, these are what form? Because you said they're just some neural net? But C is like one dimension function. It's a, so F, FJ is, is a neural net. It's a summation of activation function of the inner oh, so product. It's just a, the, the, yeah. Okay. Or not linear. It's uh, F is a non, it's like a two layer neural net. Yeah. yeah, it's some polynomial. So two and three layers, so but you need infinite order smooth activation. Yeah, infinite order smooth activation. So G is, the function G is also a two-layer thing, but G composed with F is three-layer. So this is like the concept class that you are going to learn. And actually, you can do uh, uh, improper learning. You can do agnostic learning. You can learn it with arrow. There's no problem. Uh, so what is a learning algorithm? So the, the laws we are going to use, the L2 laws and the networks. So remember to break the NTK regime, we are going to change the over-parameterization or change the learning rate. So how do we change over-parameterization? We just re-parameterize V by some V prime times A, which is low rank. And then the training algorithm is just SGD and with small learning rate. And then there is no regularization at all. There is no weight decay or anything that regularize the capacity of the algorithm with just SGD starting from random initialization. Or alternatively, we can change small learning rate to large learning rate with noise, 
just like this. So you have a weight decay on each parameter, and then you have a gradient, and then you plus a very large noise. Uh, we use artificial noise like uh, Gaussian that the, whose coherence is the coherence of the input to the neuron. Okay, so for example, VI the input is the ReLU of W times X, so you have this coherence, or WI the coherence is uh, X X plus well. So you can either do that uh, uh, change of parameter or you can do that algorithm, they can both give you the result. So this is actually the Gaussian approximation of the SGD types of noise because if you have like a, a finite batch, then your coherence of the SGD noise is approximately equal to that, but not really, so it's not a rigorous statement. And intuitively, the eventually the value of Wx will align with A through the signal of A times value of W times X, so the learning, the learned weight will just have a very big dimension in A and there's no other dominating dimension, so it's essentially the, it will convert to AA transpose, so go back to the first case. So there's no fundamental difference between the two formulations. So, okay, so now we are happy to state our theorem. And what is the theorem? Uh, so the theorem just says, given any distribution of X on the unit ball, the three-layer network R learns the, fun learns the concept class that is written in this formula up to generalization R, R, R alpha square, meaning that your H and your R are differ by some alpha square factor uh, under the following conditions. First of all, the number of neurons is uh, complexity of F, complexity of G, and one over alpha. And the sample complexity is complexity of F plus complexity of G divided by alpha to the power of four, which are all super standard. The running time is polynomial in the complexity. So they are, they are all super standard. There is nothing hard in this theorem. But what's, what's interesting is just it only depends on the individual complexity of G and F, and it doesn't depend on the complexity of the composite function. And I see lower bound, However, we, what we can prove is over some distribution of x, and obviously the overbound has to be for some distribution, because if the distribution is just a singleton, then there is, there is no lower bound. So for some distribution of x on the unit ball, and for some class of functions like g and h, uh, any kernel method that learns the concept uh, function h up to generalization error little o of alpha, remember alpha is some small uh, value, must use sample complexity that depends on the complexity of the composite function g of h, g r and f, okay? So the difference is the when neural net learns, the complexity are, either, are just g and uh, f and g, and what kernel learns, the complexity is the complexity of the composite function, which is this thing. So, this is a theorem and it's super simple. There is nothing crazy in the statement. Yes? Uh, do you know how big the gap between these two complexities? Yeah, I will cover. It, it's going to be infinite. Yeah. <laughs> so what, what do I mean by kernel method? The kernel method is like uh, you are defined any kernel like given by the feature mapping and you predict uh, the output uh, function using the feature mapping times the summation of your training example. Uh, usually the, 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 the weights are trained over the training samples, but in this, re, in this result, it doesn't matter what, how do you obtain this weight. You can use crazy algorithms, like even solving P not equal to NP, but as long as you obtain some kernel solution like this, then you are going to suffer a high generalization error. Okay, yes? Uh, so you seem to indicate that the fact that any kernel method fails is strong, but I kind of feel like then something must be wrong with the distributional assumption, because take CIFAR. I know there exists a kernel that works well. It's just I take CIFAR 10.1 or a very similar data set. Oh, yeah, yeah, works, exactly. That so will do well. Yeah, this is so, like for some class of function, which means that it has to work well yeah. for all the functions in this class. So if your CIFAR is like there exists one function, of course there exists one kernel, but if I change CIFAR to like a class of images, 
or then, a class of distribution. Yeah, a class of distribution or the image. Yeah. Or the class of uh, <coughs> class of images like uh, or the class of labeling functions. Something like the class of these functions. So it's not a single function, but a class of functions. So everything in the class. Okay. Yes. Yes. Are, yes. What sort of quantifiers here for alpha and these classes? I mean, is it uh, there are fixed classes for G and F uh, that are bad for any alpha, or does uh, alpha get small? Do you have to actually play with those classes? Uh, so basically, uh, the upper bound holds for alpha that is smaller. Then, uh, the lower bound is for any alpha. For the, the classes G and F depending on alpha, or is it No, no, it's fixed the class and for any alpha. Yeah. So you first fix G and F, then you will for, for every alpha. Yeah. Uh, or for a small alpha. Yes. Uh, just wanted to uh, learn a baseline. So if I just predict F of X, what is the generalization error? Uh, it's alpha because, yeah, it's alpha, it's so alpha, it's, right. it's, it's below both of the line. Oh, it's beautiful. Yeah, so it, this is alpha square, so you have to learn G. That's right. Yeah. What if you alternate a few times? You learn F just by using the output and then alternate a few times. Uh, yeah, that's essentially like what the neural net do. I see. Yeah. You, know, you just cannot do it in one shot like kernels do. OK, so uh, to answer his question, uh, in some cases, the com com complexity of G and F can be much, much larger than the individual complexity of G and F. They are infinitely larger. For example, when F is equal to square root D times W times X, where W is norm 1, X is a random unit vector in dimension D. And then because W times D is typically in the order of 1 over root D, so F, the output of F is typically in the order of 1. In the order of one. So it's a good function. Then the complexity of f is nothing but square root d because it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a you know the way the like the, the coefficient. Okay, and then g is just a one-dimension function which is equal to z to the power of ten, and then the complexity of g is just an order of one because the coefficient is one and the degree is constant. But the g composite with f is just is actually square root d to the power of 10 times w of x to the power of 10. So the complexity of g and f composite complexity is d to the power of 5 because these are all unit. And then this is the activation function. This is a coefficient, which is uh, square root d to the power of 10. So it's d to the 5. <coughs> and then the theorem just says, the right side learns this like square root d of the base function plus alpha times the square root d of base function to the power of 10 up to accuracy alpha square. And remember, this thing is in the order of 1, so you have to learn, like, for example, this part a little bit better. And then using like uh, d divided by poly alpha many samples for any alpha that is little of 1. And then the lower bound says that kernel method must use at least d to the 10 samples to learn this function up to uh, accuracy little of alpha. So as long as it tries to learn the degree 10 part, it just uh, have to use d to the 10 example. So, sorry to be nitpicky, but I mean, the statement at least you said there exists classes f and g. So here, are you saying this, that those classes? Yeah, essentially, these are like the bad classes. classes. Yeah. The bad classes yeah. We, in the paper, we actually use a different construction, but this one also works. Uh, right, so we basically, we probably have this following picture. When you have rice night, you can have a small s set of example and then the learning succeed. But if you use kernel method, then you use large sample pool, but the kernel method is still. So just the uh, separation actually put, put us in here. That below be up, uh, it's above the line of the kernels. OK, so there are some extension of this uh, theorem. For example, it can be extended to feature mappings instead of kernels. Uh, just remember the kernel algorithm looks like this. We will have to predict using this linear combination. But what if I use an arbitrary w that is not in the span? So here is the theorem saying that 
for linear for uh, for linear regression over feature mapping with any regularization. So the linear regression must use number of features that are in this uh, that are the composite complexity. So you can use very few samples. For example, maybe you can write a sum of square architecture that is solve the problem very efficiently. Just remember, sum of square is nothing but linear regression over feature mapping with SDP, with PSDA constraint. And maybe you can use sum of square to solve it very efficiently, but you cannot solve it uh, in a very small running time. So you have to use a lot of these uh, feature mappings and decide which one to use. Gotcha. Yes? What's wrong with just using one ReLU to achieve your separation with epsilon being small? You can learn it with gradient methods, but we know from what your theorem says, you, know, you can't learn it with any kernel method. Uh, one ReLU, that's, uh, so first of all, for, for one ReLU, you can only, like, there are two settings. The first setting is you are in the unit sphere. So the hidden weights are norm one, and x is norm one. x is, in, the input is norm one. You want to learn it up to epsilon error. Then you run in time e exponential in our epsilon. Then you can also do that using kernels. And there are other settings where you have distributional assumption, which is the input is Gaussian. And then you can learn the ReLU activation. But uh, as I said, our lower bound is distribution free. So. No, there, are, there are gradient methods that learn a single ReLU in polynomial time in epsilon, one over epsilon and the dimension. Uh, that's for that's with distribution assumption. No. Without distribution, no. it's actually um, it's actually hard. It's hard in the agnostic setting, but it's not hard if you, for example, if you just assume that. The oh yeah, yeah. So our setting is also in agnostic setting. So uh, right now, we the theorem is stated in the like. Uh, and also, Adam, if I understand correctly, that there is gradient methods, but I mean, this is maybe splitting hairs, but it's not a, a gradient on a reasonable neur on a neural net and a kind of somewhat standard neural net, right? So here, if I understand correctly, the learning method is just gradient descent on a fairly benign yeah. neural net. Right? Whereas to learn the relevance, you do gradient descent on something that doesn't look like a neural net. No, it's, it's like a neural net. Yeah, we can talk about that later. So basically, the running time is uh, slow because you will need to go through all the features. So for feature mapping, uh, yes? Oh, just two quick questions. One, instead of working with ResNet, did you also just try increasing the width and then F just passes through like with identity connections? Uh, identities with, with small uh, with small weights and any other activation uh, we didn't try this setting yet but we tried three layer without the rest night and we are going to show some experience and the, other, the other question is that so the way you're able to not pay for the composition in the generalization bound is by first learning F and then learning G as you said so did you did you also try to study uh, a more general class of functions that you could did, did you like try to understand general settings where you could do this, uh, do this sort of two or three phase learning even and, and always get not the composition but the summation of the complexities? In the uh, yeah, but you have to use some distribution assumptions and we can push the result to L layer. So you, you have to do L phase of the learning instead of two. Uh, yeah. Why is there a distributional assumption? Uh, for without distribution assumption, that's the two layer is our limitation. If you use three phase, then we cannot prove anything. But if you have distributional assumption, you can push it to LA. That's some future work that is being read. So we can also extend this upper bound to convolution nice such as this. Uh, and then we can also expand the, extend the upper bound to order of alpha square to like essentially zero with some distributional assumption. These are all some extensions. So what is the intuition behind the result? Uh, uh, like people have already figured out the right side is doing Im implicit hierarchical learning, which is it first learns F using like NTK and then it feeds F to the second layer of the network and then learn G using the second layer NTK. So it's a, the complexity is the NTK complexity, which is the complexity of F and complexity of G. So just look like this which is super simple. But kernel method is one shot learning, so it learns G of F from scratch as if there is no base signal Fx, which is very inefficient. 
no matter how cleverly you write the kernel, you just cannot really use the information of f because it's convex and even linear. So the learning is implicit hierarchical because the two, layer, two, two layers are trained simultaneously and there is no change of the learning rate. So you don't really train the first layer and then train the second layer. And then there is no regularization of the first layer. So, and also there is no regularization on the first on the second layer. So the right side has to act, really distribute the learning process automatically. There is no outer force that force it to first layer F then layer G. It's automatic. They are trained together. Okay. So here is the higher level intuition. So as people have figured out, it's really simple. You just learn f using NTK up to accuracy alpha. And then you feed like f plus minus alpha up to the second layer of G. And then you will learn G up to accuracy alpha. So your total accuracy is alpha squared because G has a alpha arrow. So, so if you use this uh, conclusion, then probably you will just get this. Like uh, everything is wrong. Why? Because the total accuracy is actually alpha since f is only learned in the first layer up to accuracy alpha. So when you learn the second layer, you actually help the first layer to correct the error of f. So you cannot do it by first learning f and then layer g. So you have to use the, the g to help the first layer to learn f more accurate. Okay? So it's important that the both layers are trained together. Okay, it's just a high level intuition of the result and it's also super simple. And this is essentially the proof. The proof is very simple and like everything I just said. So the key message is that both layers are still individual NTK, but after learning the first layer actually feeds some better input to the NTK of the second layer. This is a learning process that allows it to go beyond NTK. So it's like an implicit hierarchical learn. Is alpha inversely polynomial in the complexity of F? No, no. It only depends on the complexity of G. I see. Inversely yeah. in the complexity of G. Uh, yeah, alpha is less than like lower G. Okay. So here is an experiment that we want to say that the theorem is good, but what if we use real neural net and train it using some arbitrary learning rate and whatever? So we designed this function h, which is equal to beta times fx plus alpha times g of x. So alpha is 0 0.3 and beta is 1. And f is some uh, function that has 8 output, and g is some function, like a degree 4 parity, that has 8 output. OK, this is our two example. And I, x is like a uniform sample from that. And then what we try is like we try 100 examples and we vary different m, so you have different number of hidden neurons. So you can see this line is a three right night, like what we prove. It's always below this. And this is a baseline where you learn f, but you learn nothing about g. And the three layer network actually go below it a little bit, but definitely not as good as right night. And then you have NTK or training last layer. They are all above, so you cannot learn that. Okay. And also the alpha is small, it's necessary. So we, we choose alpha equal to 0 0.3 and we change beta. So you can see these two lines, they are like beta is 0 0.2 or beta is 0. So beta is the, base sig the coefficient of base signal. You can see when the coefficient of the base signal is too small, you can learn nothing. So you cannot learn G at all, you can just learn F. So you have to have a very large base signal. So which means that our assumption is kind of necessary that our base signal is larger than the composite signal. It's not an artifact of the proof. And then there is a more interesting experiment that we want to verify our intuition. That is, we actually feed better inputs to NTK instead of changing the feature mapping. So remember, ReLU is something like a feature mapping that is equal to the indicator times a linear of the base. So we just change a ReLU to a really decompose a ReLU to an indicator, uh, then to a feature mapping, and then times a different weight. So this W1 and W2. Uh, so we need to replace the indicator by indicator tilde 
because we, we want to keep the function to be Lipschitz. Okay. And during the training, W1 stays at random initialization. So your feature mapping is always random. You only use random feature mapping. So it's always NTK. And only the linear thing is trained. Every layer is NTK. And so it does not learn a better feature mapping, but feed better input to the feature mapping. Intuitively, it's not a formal statement. So our right side, that is eight times wide. For the original network, that is ReLU, you can achieve on CFR 10, 95.55. And for the modified network, it's very close. And even on CFR 100, it's still relatively close, just down by one point whatever percent. But definitely much, much better than kernel. So this is a deep linear network. No, it's not deep linear. You have this, uh, you change every value by this one. This so you don't have the indicator, but all your train is W2. You don't train yes, the that's feature. That's a line. linear network, right? Because I freeze the activation and only, so it's linear network means product of parameters, right? Yeah, yeah, it's, uh, it's, yeah, it's really a linear network. Yeah, it's a linear network, not a linear function. Yeah, it's a linear, a linear network. network. Yeah, it's, it's really a linear network. Yeah. So and even for this linear network, you can do that. Yeah. So you can see you really, you really, what all you need is feed better input to the feature mapping. Ah, sorry, it's not really linear. Uh, what I say is wrong. So the activation actually change because your, your, your next layer actually feeds different X to this, so it changed this one. And it's not really a linear, yeah, yeah sorry. Okay, yeah, so just a summary. So in this talk, what we show is that we have under OPS condition, which is this, over parameterization, probably initialization, small learning rate, so neural network go, uh, so your neural network is NTK, and neural network goes beyond NTK when some conditions are broken. For example, uh, yeah, and then there are more work. For example, you break the small learning rate to schedule learning rate. This is a new paper that I talked at some places, so it's, it's on archive now. And that says if you use scheduled learning rate instead of small learning rate, then you learn something with better generalization than NTK. It's also provable, lower and upper bound. And also you change the initializations, and you can learn ReLU network with lower parameterized ReLU network under some distribution or something. Uh, okay, so there's some future direction. For example, neural net is probably better than any kernel method. So we have show here, but what about any convex algorithm? For example, can we show this line here? So I believe if we can show something here, then we are really entering the deep learning regime. But now we are not really close to that. So I think this is a very important future direction because convex learning algorithms are very powerful, like some of swears. Okay, thanks. Yes. Uh, I guess do, do we know that? Uh, um, like, a, I don't think we have any example that can show that uh, any any algorithm that can be better than convex algorithm. Right? Uh, no, I mean convex optimization instead of convex algorithm. So you have to use the optimization uh, okay. instead of uh, any ar arbitrary algorithm. For example, sum of square is like a linear regression or feature mapping, which we actually rule out because we rule out linear regression over feature mapping. We didn't rule out the sample complexity, but we rule out essentially the running time, so you have to use a lot of features. And you may reduce the sample complexity. But, but I guess I just mean that uh, some of the score seems to be believed, we believe to be at least one possibility if we believe in UGC. Uh, yeah, it's in poly, yeah, but it's sum of square algorithm instead of sum of square optimization. So yeah, we can talk about that uh, later, okay. yeah. Okay, thank you, Yanzi. Oh, uh, this is a speaker. I know that. Uh, 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 <laughs> so, uh, our. Uh, our speaker now, the last speaker today, is Hani, and she will tell us about size